Christian world, ICU, and of course laboratories. When COVID-19 started, even before it became a pandemic, I think we had just three or four. But as of today, I think we have well over 80 about molecular labs. So that is positive. The same goes for ICU, intensive care units. Some of the centers, if not many of our centers, did not have intensive care units. But as of today, we have quite a The same thing goes for even the general wards. Some have been expanded, uh, more patients. Number two is the issue of um, human resource for health. Because if you are expanding the physical infrastructure on ground, you need human resource for health to cope. Like in laboratories, and the all the health workers, the doctors, the nurses, the medical laboratory scientists, you need everyone. So you will necessarily, uh, you will employ people and then uh, recall that at some point in time, the PTL, the PTL that we were recalling those who had left the service and those who were to retire, particularly at that, at the beginning, that we will ask them to stay and extending their tenure, if you like, call it tenure elongation for them. So, uh, that is also a kind of positive. Uh, and uh, even outside of the health sector, the economy to some extent has benefited because we now have a number of industries that are using PPEs, face shields, face masks, even the wares, the boots, local industry, quite a number of them now. And they producing uh, these PPEs that are as, uh, as good, if not even better than the, the, the imported ones. So I think then that is uh, uh, something uh, positive. Of course, in the area of uh, research, uh, we have increased our research capacity. You will recall that um, the Nigerian Institute of uh, Medical Research, NIMA, very early uh, during this pandemic, uh, working with uh, the, 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 um, the, the Center of Excellence, they, they were able to determine the genetic uh, sequence of the, the virus that we had here at that point in time, and it was established to be the same type of uh, virus that was first discovered in Wuhan, in China, where the outbreak uh, started. So, and it's just not restricted to, to, to Western men, our, our local practitioners, at least the herbal practitioners, they have come up with so many products, yes, we might not have been able Establish that uh, this, you know, works for for this thing. One good, but the, the process is ongoing. But so many uh, researches are going on, uh, both in Western medicine and, of course, in the uh, uh, traditional complementary and uh, and uh, I mean, alternative uh, medicine area. So if you if you now move on to the the, 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 the negative impact, of course. The one that is very obvious is mortality and morbidity. Sadly enough, we've lost quite a number of people during this pandemic. That's a negative thing. And of course, if you move from that, there are some other reasons that may be responsible for some of these things. And what do I mean? Naturally, what COVID does, COVID is so selfish that it attracts the attention of everyone, thereby diverting attention to other things. 
the routine healthcare services have suffered. That is the truth. Programs like HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis program, and the, the like, malaria program, some of these programs, they have suffered. They have not really had the attention. We try as much as possible to ensure that we do not neglect this program. But in reality, the time, the efforts, the attention that uh, COVID-19 is taking out of everyone, not just health workers, is enough to um, reduce the attention to other um, disease conditions or and programs. Again, if you look at what we've been able to do during this pandemic, when you have a lockdown, when you have coffee, you naturally reduce what people can do. There could have been some cases that could not get to hospital because of lockdown. There could have been cases that could not get to hospital because vehicles were not available for them. So these are realities, and uh, we, we just cannot uh, wish this away. Even for the antenatal care, people may not readily go for antenatal care, and people may not even readily go to hospitals because of fear of contracting COVID-19 infection. So a lot of people would rather stay at home because of that fear, which is genuine. A lot of people would not just go to the hospital, they would rather stay at home and try to manage themselves because of the fear of contracting COVID-19. So these are some of the negative uh, you know, impact. Of course, still on the positive side, it just occurred to me that we have increased our you know, virtual engagement. So online engagement for knowledge sharing, for knowledge acquisition and all that, uh, peer review and all that. So we have, we, have, we, have, we have engaged in things that probably would not ordinarily, but we, we, it's the new normal which we have come to terms with. So I think these are some of the, these are some of the uh, uh, positive and negative impacts that we have seen uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'll start with the first question that was um, directed um, at the chairman. Uh, why did we not uh, ban flights um, from UK and South Africa? Well, it wasn't an easy decision. We had quite a robust discussion. One thing we need to remember is we had a protocol back in September. This protocol required that we passengers coming into Nigeria do a test for COVID-19 and have to be PCR negative within five days. Not more than five days. They have to be PCR negative within five days before they can board the flight. When they come into Nigeria, they are supposed to self-isolate for seven days and then do a repeat test and confirm they are negative before they exit the isolation. Nigeria is one of the few countries that has had a double testing policy in September. When the problem arose with the UK and later on South Africa, a lot of countries temporarily banned flights from the UK. And what did they do? They implemented the very same policies that we've had for more than four months running. So why would we follow them and ban flights as well if we already have a policy in place that was strict and regardless of the issues of implementation, who are there and subsequently countries followed us. So in addition to the policy we had, we also put in place additional stringent measures. So one, if you're coming from UK and South Africa, you have to use the portal, you have to pay for the travel test at day seven after arrival. You have to upload all your documents before you're even allowed to board. So that's an, in addition to what applies to other countries. And then secondly, we have a register for all passengers coming from the UK and South Africa to enable us 
actively chase these passengers up and make sure they do the testing at day 7. If by day 10 they do not test, they, their names go immediately onto our penalty list. We don't even wait until day 14. And then finally, for any passenger coming from these two countries that has a positive result, it's immediately flagged out by the laboratory. The data is sent to NTDC and his sample or her sample is sent for sequencing. So with all these additional measures, we didn't feel it was really absolutely necessary for us to ban flights from the UK or South Africa simply to copy other nations that were now adopting a policy we've had since September. In terms of uh, lockdowns, I never used the word yet. I didn't say we were not on lockdown yet. I was very careful. So go back and check. You can have the recording again, but I am very sure I never used the word yet for lockdown. So the decision for lockdown is in whose hands? It's not in the PTL's hands. It's in the hands of all of us, the general public. Because who wants to have a lockdown? We know the impact it's had on our economy. We know the impact it's had on other, men, on the other parts of the economy and the country. It's very difficult. And it makes life difficult for everybody. But the reason why we're worried about the numbers is because at some point, if the numbers continue to trend in this way, our health system will get overwhelmed. And it's not just about those persons that will die from COVID. It's not just the persons that will die from COVID. It's people like you and me that might have other conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, malaria, other treatable conditions that will not even be able to access health services because the health services have been overwhelmed by COVID. So, in as much as I've been told I'm threatening a lockdown, I'm not threatening a lockdown, I'm just saying the fact that we need to comply with these protocols, we need to make sure we use our masks, physical distancing, and hand sanitizer. There are countries in the world that are currently open, very open, their, their airports are open, their businesses are open, but they make sure that everybody wears a mask and they're able to keep the numbers down. And if we do the same, we will be okay. But if we don't, and we get overwhelmed, and we start having huge number of deaths, and the health system is not coping, what do you think will happen? And that's my case. Thank you. Uh, I think Mr. Ray asked us, asked me to remind Nigerians on how often you can have reinfections. Okay. So, um, from what we know right now, reinfections can happen. Um, it's been fairly well documented. To document a reinfection, you have to be sure that it's actually a reinfection and not a case of persisting infection from the first case. So, you do that either by virus isolation or some or sequencing to show that it's a different uh, virus. So that's been demonstrated. It's fairly rare uh, still. The science generally suggests that the second infection is generally milder than the first one. Um, it's also been shown that it's likely that natural immunity for this virus wanes over time. We cannot really know how many reinfections you can have because remember this is a virus that we've only known for 12 months. Um, so as time uh, proceeds we will learn a lot more on if you can have multiple infections or just a, a couple of times which is what has been documented. I can't, we can't know for sure if you can have it severally until we follow people over longer periods of time. But a lot of science is emerging about this. Immunity to viruses is a very complex Thing. As we get vaccines, we immunize, we understand uh, the life cycle of these viruses in a lot more detail. But the key message 
It's all of that is academic if we do our very best in terms of what we need to do. For now, even when we do get the vaccine, it will take a while to get to immuni uh, population immunity levels that we require to let go, let down our guards altogether, right? So we just have to face a future this year that we will have to continue doing these things that we need to do. So everything we've been talking about, uh, non pharmaceutical interventions, we will need to continue. If we reach 40%, uh, which I'm absolutely confident that we will get to, 40% uh, will not be sufficient to get to the levels of immunity on a population basis for us to completely drop our guards. So we have to be honest with each other and say this thing, we'll keep working very hard, but uh, also prepare ourselves for some more prolonged action. Uh, but ultimately, like everyone has said here, a lot of, there are some things that are outside our control completely. You can't stop every single meeting. But for those that can stop, for those that can be done virtually, for the actions that are in our hands, we all need to do what is necessary to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, yes. DJ CDC. May I now invite DJ. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the PTF. I believe I had a question on the palliatives uh, for. Unfortunately, I've been on uh, vacation. I only resumed this morning, and I'm yet to give uh, my handover brief. So, uh, right now, I cannot make uh, any comments on this until I go through my briefing tomorrow. Thank you very much. Let us now invite the Executive Director, National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, Dr. Faisal Shai. Thank you very much. Uh, the first question was from Nancy. Uh, she wanted to know what other uh, conversations we're having around accessing uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, apart from the COVAX uh, facility, we're also in multiple conversations uh, with uh, the Russians over their Sputnik V uh, vaccine, uh, the Chinese uh, for the Sinovac. Uh, we're also having conversations uh, with uh, the United Arab uh, Emirates. So there are multiple uh, conversations uh, that are going on, uh, including bilateral conversations with uh, uh, companies. Uh, the Honorable Minister of Health is leading on some of those uh, conversations. But really, I think the issue is not about just the timelines uh, for the vaccines to come. We are anxious, we want the vaccines to get here, but we also want vaccines that have been fully certified as safe and potent uh, for uh, use. Uh, some of the other uh, vaccines, candidate vaccines, are still undergoing clinical trials. So as we have those conversations with these multiple entities, uh, we're mindful that uh, it is only vaccines that have, uh, have gotten approval from stringent regulatory uh, uh, organiz uh, authorities and have uh, WHO uh, support that we will be bringing to Nigeria. At a minimum, they should have stringent uh, regulatory uh, agencies that have uh, approved them uh, before they are brought to Nigeria, and NAFDAQ can also go through the process of validating uh, their uh, suitability for use in Nigeria. Then you asked about uh, how we will continue to uh, monitor these vaccines when they get to the subnational level. Uh, so, with this particular
in all the way to when the vaccine is administered. Okay, so we're going to be having those types of uh, data to make sure that there's close monitoring of when the vaccine arrives and when it gets uh, deployed to the uh, field. Uh, in any case, even before this particular vaccine, as an agency, we have what we call the Follow the Vaccine Initiative, where uh, with routine immunization vaccines, we find there are ways uh, that we follow up with every batch of vaccine to see when they are deployed to the state, when they get to the local government areas, and when they get to the health uh, facilities. Then you, uh, you also asked if there will be no need uh, to wear masks. Absolutely not. Of course, after the vaccine, vaccination, you still need to wear uh, the, the masks because uh, although you've taken the vaccines, you still are able to uh, transmit uh, the virus. So even in the interest of those people that uh, live with you, those people that are in your neighborhood, uh, it is important uh, that you continue to uh, wear the vaccines and continue all the other non-pharmaceutical uh, uh, interventions. Uh, the second question was uh, how we plan to raise uh, the funds for the vaccines. Uh, so we have previously mentioned that uh, we try to cover 70% of uh, Nigeria's population. Uh, because of uh, the collaboration with the COVAX facility, 20% out of the 70% of the vaccines uh, will be given free of charge to Nigerians. So it's the balance of the 60% that Nigeria will be paying for. And in terms of how we're going to raise the funds, we expect to raise the funds from domestic uh, resources. Uh, there was a question from the Voice of Nigeria, uh, if there's going to be any strategy to impose uh, vaccination on Nigeria if, if people resist. I think the message uh, from the Presidential Task Force has consistently been that we will listen, we will listen, we will listen to the concerns raised by Nigerians and try the best that we can to explain to them. Once Nigerians are given the information, our experience in the last 20, 30 years with polio eradication is that they usually come around. You have to get the right information and get the right people that they listen to. Okay, so for example, it could be somebody who is adducing religious reasons for not wanting to take a vaccine. But if you bring his religious uh, leader, you know, who understands even better than we do to explain that it is not against uh, the religion, then absolutely we find that Nigerians will accept. And I do not think that it will come to a situation where we will ever have to force people to take uh, the vaccines. We're going to work extra hard uh, to make sure that people understand and I believe that people will come around. And really, from some of the conversations that we had with your colleagues, I think you know that is very, very possible. So it's not just about the PTF, but this is something that even the media needs to do, right? This is uh, a work that you also have to support us in doing in making sure the right communication, the right information about these vaccines are out there. And I'm sure that we'll be able to uh, overcome this initial uh, hesitancy that people have uh, just because they don't have a full uh, uh, you know, uh, information around uh, the, the vaccines. Uh, there was a question from uh, from NTA, from NTA. From uh, he, he asked how much... There's no doubt about the fact that these vaccines are expensive. So, for example, the Pfizer vaccine in the open market costs about uh, 35 dollars, 35 US dollars per dose. Uh, the Moderna vaccine is about 20 US dollars per dose. Uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is about four dollars per, per dose, right? So these are quite expensive vaccines. This is why we're using the opportunity of the Covax uh, that is giving us up to 20 percent of these uh, vaccines uh, free. Uh, like you know, Economics 101, when the uh, demand is high, the cost will be high. Is that not so? And as the demand, you know, trickles down, and we expect that the cost of these uh, vaccines will definitely come down. So it's an evolving situation, and uh, what the Presidential Task Force is doing is also looking and 
projecting which types of vaccines were going to be using. Well, right now, it seems the predominant vaccines are the mRNA types, the Pfizer and the Moderna, but in the course of the next few weeks, we believe that there will be more production of uh, the Oxford, AstraZeneca, which is cheaper, and by, 20, by the end of 2021, 2022, we expect that because there will be a ramping up of production, uh, a lot of pharmaceutical companies will, you know, be actually uh, will have more than uh, is required in terms of uh, our need for, for vaccines. So the cost is definitely going to uh, evolve over time, and it's going to uh, be something that we will uh, that is dynamic, right? So right now we've not zeroed in on the total cost, but there are you know potential uh, estimates of what this might uh, might cost, but we've not zeroed in on how much it's going to. Uh, cost and whatever estimates we make now, we know for sure that as more vaccines become available, those costs are likely uh, going to drop. Uh, uh, going to drop. Uh, I think pretty much those are the questions that were directed to me. Thank you. We are gradually grinding down our briefing for today. I know that uh, there was a question directed at the chairman of PTF. He would handle the question as, as well as his closing remarks. Yes, we please. Good question. It's been answered. I think it's been answered, but I think uh, Dr. Sani gave the, uh, the, uh, the professional angle to the question why we have not uh, banned flights. Madam Son, I think you were the one that asked this. Why we have not banned flights uh, from the UK? considering the outside of, of, of numbers. What I said uh, this evening is, I said it's very instructive to state that factors have contributed uh, to the rise in numbers from late November, included international and local travels, business and religious activities, the opening of schools, a combination of all these without strict compliance with COVID-19 safety measures. So, it's a combination of several things. We gradually opened up the space and there have been movements up and down, activities day and night. That would trigger an upsurge in the figures, because most people have decided that uh, COVID-19 has been defeated for the year 2020. So let's just go to town and behave as if COVID-19 too has gone on leave or is in recession. And then aggregates community transmission. So at every level of our community as a result of either international travels, local travels, schools and places of worship being open, businesses being open, even where we have not lifted the restriction on nightclubs, bars, restaurants, except for drive-ins and also Pickups, all these places are open. All these places are open. But if they were open in a measured and considered way, with strict enforcement of the non pharmaceutical interventions, we would have been able to moderate the figures and the numbers that we are seeing now. But as long as we don't do that, our figures will keep rising. In one week, we moved from 5,000 plus to 9,000. By any stretch of projection, you know that the figure will increase next week. It's not rocket science, it's simple. That as long as we do not adhere strictly to these non pharmaceutical interventions and ensure that at the subnational levels there are enforcement. By the time we come back here next week, we'll be reporting something in the region of 15,000 if the figures progress in the manner in which they are progressing. 
Păi să vezi cine să și voi, de lemuri. Dacă Sania a spus about the reasons why I with no band flights coming in from the UK, particularly in South Africa. We are put in place. in Nigeria. And the truth about it is that if our people have been disciplined enough or have been disciplined enough to adhere to these measures, who would have been able to tempt this virus? And the truth about it is that we are talking about the UK now is just because of the new strength in, uh, coming out of the UK. In the last 24 hours, USA reported 213,453 cases. Almost five times the number that came out of the UK. So if you are talking about banning, we will ban all flights then. But you see, the fact of the matter is that we are all Nigerians. But let me tell you the strict sense, the real strict sense that informed part of the decision that we took. If we ban flights, coming or going to the UK from Nigeria. All of you who go to Ghana or Benin Republic and bought the flight there. We did it before. When Abacha in 1990s, I didn't. We will not be able to put in place or in place a comprehensive protocol that people who decide to cross the borders to go on flights and return through those routes. So in, in addition to the, to the science that informed the decision, we also had to think smart like Nigerians. Not to give you the benefit of crossing the borders without tracking, travel, Come back the same route, we can't track you. And we'll have the whole place messed up. So it is better for us to make sure that we put additional protocols in place that will help curtail a new resurgence of a violent that we do not know its characteristics like the first one. And that's why you can see that there were additional protocols that have been put in place with regards to flight from the UK and South Africa.